Welcome to the Middle Tech Spotlight Series, where we highlight entrepreneurs, investors, and ecosystem supporters that are building our startup ecosystem. We've been interviewing founders for over four years now, and we use this series to keep tabs on the companies being built here. Today, we're talking with Kobe Hastings and Chris Michelson of Sales River, formerly known as Lead Rilla, being built in Lexington, Kentucky. Kobe and Chris are the CEO and Chief Revenue Officer, respectively, and this will be our third time featuring Kobe on the podcast. So Sales River is a software platform that empowers insurance sales teams to operate more efficiently, effectively, transparently, and compliantly. And so the software is used by large insurance carriers and agencies all around the country. We'll get into how the platform does all of that and how it's evolved since Kobe started the company. But first, we want to highlight the sponsors that make this podcast possible. Before highlighting our sponsors, we'd just like to state that the views and content shared on this platform do not necessarily reflect those of our show sponsors. Middle Tech is presented by KY Innovation, the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development's Office of Entrepreneurship. KY Innovation exists to support and develop Kentucky's startup ecosystem, and we are proud to be supported by an organization whose mission aligns so closely with ours. If you're a founder building in Kentucky, you need to check out the resources that KY Innovation has to offer. You can find more information by clicking the link in our show notes or going to kyinnovation.com. Middle Tech is sponsored by Bolt Marketing. Take your website to the next level with a website that's built to work. At Bolt Marketing, they're revolutionizing websites for small businesses that are affordable, customizable, and hassle-free. Whether you have a construction company, a boutique clothing store, or you own a hot yoga studio, they have options for you. Click the link in our show notes to explore their marketing options that can transform your marketing and grow your business. And as a personal note, Bolt Marketing built our website, and they were awesome to work with throughout the entire process. We highly recommend working with them. All right, Kobe, Chris. It's been a high octane day so far. We've had a full team-wide company meeting, and now we're sitting here getting to record a podcast and dive into what exactly we're doing at Sales River. So thank you both for taking the time. Chris, thank you for taking the time before hopping on a plane here in like two hours to head back. Yeah, we're definitely cutting it close. Yeah, we are. (laughs) We are. Um, So like I said, Kobe, this is your third time on the podcast. Um, We had you on briefly when we were doing kind of the new segments to talk about the fundraise uh, and starting the Sales River brand, but we really want to take this podcast to dive into what all has changed uh, since Leadrilla became Sales River? Because we really haven't done a full deep dive since then. And before we dive into that, I just want to tell the story real quick of how I got this job because it's so relevant to middle tech and it means a lot to me personally. Um, I joined the podcast pretty much right out of college. Uh, we interviewed Kobe on the podcast shortly after. This was right when you had started. 2020? Yeah, 2020. It might have been earlier than that. Yeah, maybe yeah. early 2020. Um, had you on the podcast and you reached back out to us and you were like, hey, our team's growing pretty quick. We're looking to bring somebody on uh, that wants to work at a startup. And at the time, I was really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, so I raised my hand. I said, I'd love to join. And I've been here over three and a half years now, which is crazy. Somehow you're still here. I say, he still, still doesn't here. know what he wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow the team has grown from five of us, as you mentioned in our meeting today, playing beer pong in a small office to uh, 23 of us uh, and some key hires and things have gotten pretty legitimate now. So um, let's just start off this conversation by telling us about some of the updates since we last spoke with you. Yeah, there's been a lot. Um, I could probably take 20 minutes going through all those. Uh, but high level, in December of last year, 2022, we raised a Series A. Um, so that was about $4 million, led by Mucker Capital in L.A. Um, soon after that raise, uh, we launched a new brand, which is Sales River. Uh, <laughs> so Lead Rilla still exists. We'll probably dig into that a little bit today, but Sales River is our, our main brand now. Um, and yeah, just a lot of growth. The team's at 23 full-time employees now. Uh, so, yeah. It's been, it's been a blast too. It's been uh, a roller coaster to say the least. Uh, and one of those things uh, that we talked about growing the team to 23, key hires. Um, so not only hiring people and growing the team, but bringing on some people that have a lot of industry experience. We can really take our company to the next level just in terms of having the industry connections and the industry knowledge that we really need and needed uh, to get to that next level. So this is where I want to introduce Chris. Uh, Chris Michelson, an industry veteran, um, been in the industry that we're in for a long time. And before I let you talk about your career, I want to tell the story of meeting you uh, because it's one of my favorite (laughs) stories from uh, from being in this industry. So we get to travel a lot and go to a lot of conferences. Uh, One of the conferences we were at, we were at Topgolf in Las Vegas. Um, I'd had a few drinks and I was feeling real loose and swinging real hard. So I, uh, I was hitting golf balls kind of over the net at Top Golf, and I managed to get Casually. a crowd. <laughs> I managed to get a crowd around me watching me do it. 
and Chris was one of the people watching. Uh, and after I got done hitting, uh, hitting these golf balls, Chris came up to me. He's like, you're an idiot for not going and getting every single person's card standing around you. Cause I had like, you know, all these insurance executives awesome. watching me and I didn't take it. <laughs> We're at like an event with like the C <laughs> levels of like, you know, the Mara Life's Humanas, all these yeah, people are sitting I'm, there watching him and he's just like, I'm having fun hitting golf. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not necessarily doing my job networking like I should have been. And so Chris called that out, which I really appreciated. And then you invited me to dinner that night and that's uh, how we met and got close. And then everything kind of grew from there. Did um, you know who he was? When he was hitting those golf balls? I had, yeah, I had met him. But, like, it was, like, brief interactions, like, you know, talking to Kobe and just, like, brief passings. I hadn't really spent any significant time with Logan at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so tell us, uh, for those who may not know what a CRO does, tell us a bit about what your role at this company looks like. We'll talk more about your career and what what all you've done up until this point, but let's just first establish, like, what's your role here? What are you you doing as CRO? Yeah, I'm going to start off with, like, I took a sip of water five minutes ago, and I've been, like, trying not to just outwardly cough, but it's like, <laughs> as soon as I took a sip of water, I just like went down the rug tube, of course. <clears throat> but uh, CRO. So uh, CRO is a weird position, right? Because you're responsible for all of the revenue operations of a business. But like what falls under revenue operations? You have sales. It's basically everyone client facing, right? So it's your customer success team. And whether that is from an account management standpoint or like a true CSR dealing with like tech related problems. It's your sales team, your SDR team. So your top of funnel through all the way contracting down to the account manager that's handling the account from day to day to the tech support squad. That's like helping what button do I click? Where do I push that out? Where do I push that in? And a revenue officer also tends to sit alongside or on top of marketing as well, right? Because marketing is what's driving the leads to generate the revenue. So it's kind of one of these like dual role uh, executive positions that I love because kind of like you, right? Uh, We've had this conversation before. You don't want to feel like you're just pigeonholed into one thing. Like, I don't think I could ever like just do sales my whole life or just do marketing. I really love the blend of both. And then seeing the data matrix on how, you know, marketing affects sales and sales can affect the way that you market outwardly. Yeah. And to, to tie together, you joining our team as sales leadership and me joining the company early. I was our first sales hire, but I was hired with no experience. I didn't have any prior sales experience. I was a good communicator, and that's basically what carried me the entire way to this point in my career. Uh, big shout out to Middle Tech for teaching me how to talk coherently, basically. Um, and when uh, when we met Chris and we had started talking to Chris, Chris actually became uh, a client of ours, and we'll talk a little bit about that as you talk about your career. Um, but I knew immediately once we had met Chris and started talk, having the conversation to bring him on, I was like, this needs to happen because I knew I was not yet equipped to be in a sales leadership position. I knew I still needed to learn. And so that was a big reason uh, why I talked to Kobe so much. Like, I think this is a, a really good idea to bring Chris on. So Chris, take that and let's talk about your career leading up to this because you've had a ton of experience in the space that we're in. Are you saying that because I have so much grain in my beard or? No. That's it. <laughs> Salt and pepper. Right. And all the regret Logan has now of recommending that I join. But um, <laughs> so... Uh, my career is pretty much always focused on sales and or marketing, right? And and usually even without like a CRO designation, I found myself in both sides at the same time. So I'd say like my first real job was uh, I was a nurse recruiter, right? So like helping nurses find per diem and travel nursing opportunities, which is a huge thing now since COVID. But before that, almost, you know, a very, very small percentage of people even knew what that was. Um, I started off as like a call center rep, headset on, cold calling nurses, trying to get them jazzed about traveling and getting paid more to do so, right? Um, Within like a month or two of doing that, I was leading the room that I was a part of. Within six months of that, I was leading like the whole East Coast. And by about a year into that, I was the national recruiting director. So we had teams up and down the East Coast and a few uh, stretching into the the Bible Belt area. Um, And I sat out over all those call centers. And part of that role was like learning the leads game, right? Like, how do you fill a dialer full of leads? And I figured out ways to get lists of nurses for free through state, uh, you know, you're a licensed uh, person as a state licensed uh, employee uh, when you have like your RN license, right? So I found lists on these state sites and would scrape them. We'd pay a couple pennies to get that data appended per record throw them into the dialer, I cut our costs like, you know, like 200%. The owner of the company was like, 
what? <laughs> there was a few states you had to pay for, like, you know, New York, you have to pay for and a couple others. But anyway, so then I started to learn how like a dialer worked and I started to learn how leads worked and how getting the right leads in into a right system, getting into your sales agents and then training your sales agents how to properly sell kind of makes that machine of what the actual business works. And I just love that. And then 2008 hit and that was like, you know, the big recession that everybody went through. And I worked for a recruiting company, which was responsible for hiring people when everyone was getting fired, businesses were losing money left and right. And, uh, you know, the, the company that I was working for just really started to truncate and shrink down. And it just became like a really, uh, it just wasn't very fulfilling anymore at that point. So, you know, I, I found myself looking for a new career. Uh, I got in with a large tech company in South Florida. Um, kind of trial and error in terms of applying there because they wanted to hire me for call center because I was sales. I was like, no, I want to do marketing. I want to do marketing. I want to do marketing. There's a good story there. Probably better fitted for another time. But, um, you know, that was my first intake into like digital marketing and digital leads and, and how this all works. And then I, uh, the president of the company uh, left and I left around the same time and he and I had gotten quite close. He got another position within a large insur insurance uh, FMO, brought me in there as their marketing director. And that was like my first instance into uh, insurance marketing. Um, from there, just learning how, you know, product works from carrier down through an FMO, down to agencies, down to agents, and just understanding that whole ecosystem, uh, testing the waters and you know, various paid search uh media platforms, so whether it's like search engine marketing and, you know, your SEMs, um, it, whether it's uh, the social marketing, whether it's just general outbound dialing, um, just learning the nuances of that. And then working with the actual licensed agent who's helping those potential beneficiaries out. Um, as time went on, I just kept ascending in my career. I, I guess I did a few things pretty well. Um, and if you do the same thing for long enough as I have, hopefully you 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 get to the point where you are, where you can kind of sit at the top and help direct teams and teach people like, you know, smart people like Logan, how to how to kind of take the next step in their career and in their development. And I've been very, very blessed that I've I've been able to to get into some some serious roles. Before Sales River, I was the chief revenue officer of quote.com. I help them build out an entire partner network. I help them like leverage this entire community of uh, big carriers, uh, FMOs, uh, large agencies that trusted the quote brand to facilitate leads and calls to their licensed agents. Um, and we build out an entire new division of their business. And the money that we generated from that piece of the business allowed them to expand into some real powerful paid search. Um, they're one of the largest, uh, paid search teams now in the auto insurance space. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that like what I built allowed them to expand into those marketplaces. They've made a few other key acquisitions uh, on top of that. Um, and you know, when I met Kobe, uh, I, I, the first thing I'm pretty sure I said to him was like, you named your, your business after a gorilla. <laughs> Cause he was still lead real at the time. He's like, well, that's, that's, that's a, you know, shut up. You gotta listen. And, you know, and, and then he showed me like what he was building on the back end, which is sales river. And it was like, oh my gosh, like where has a product like this been? Right. I mean, I've been in the leads and calls game forever. I've used every lead or call routing platform that exists in the marketplace. And then what he's shown me, how it, it was built specifically for the end user and, and all the management structure that lives above that actual independent agent. It's a very convoluted uh, ecosystem. And what he built simplifies it so much. It was a no brainer for me once, uh, once it became evident that there would, might be an opportunity to work together to make the shift, right? And I don't know if you guys know anything about the leads and call space uh, or just marketing for that. It can get exhausting and I've been doing it for about 20 years. So very exciting. I'm very happy to be here. We have an awesome team. We're continuing to scale. Um, it's very cool. I get to do fun stuff like this too. So when you get here and, you know, Lead Real slash now Sales River is coming out of this founder led sales, early employee led sales motion, which, you know, you always got to transition out of that at some point. And so I assume that that is happening now. When you get into a business that early stage, what are some of the first things you look at and try to improve or build systems around? Yeah, uh, that's an awesome question. Um, 
I think it was easier for me to get him out of sales than it was for him. I think the first sales call he heard, he was doing push-ups in the background, just trying to get the anxiety <laughs> of, okay, I'm letting somebody else like really take the reins here. Because you're more of a product guy, right? That's where you like to spend yeah, your time yeah. or no? Yeah, more of a product guy. I mean, I'm an engineer by trade, yeah. but you know, being a sole founder for and a self-funded company for the first four years in business, I kind of did everything. Yeah. Like I wanted to wear every single hat. So there's a huge trade-off when like you have to let go of those reins. For sure. And so when Chris started, that was like the beginning of that. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So the first things you look at are... Yeah. So the first things that I, I came in and did was just like the structure, right? I mean, the first two or three days and I came into office, which I think was a great exercise, by the way. For anyone working remote, if you join a new org, it should be policy that your first week, two weeks, whatever is, is in-house with whatever org that you're working with. It's just, there's a profound connection that takes place in that, in that time period uh, and a visibility that you can't get by looking through a screen, you know? Um, but the first things that I looked at were just the organizational structure. I think that's actually the first question that I asked our chief of staff here is where's, where's the org chart? I want to see how everybody rolls up and where we work at. I conducted uh, independent interviews with every single client or whatever every single employee that we have, because uh, I really wanted to understand, like, what's your day-to-day -day look like? Where are your successes coming from? Where are your fails coming from? Where do you think that you could do better? Why are you unable to do that? And just kind of shut up and let them talk. Um, and while they're talking, I'm click-clacking notes away and, and just organizing all my thoughts. Um, and then, you know, within, I mean, literally within, I think the first 24 hours of being here, I came to Kobe and I was like, we kind of got to start a lot of this over. Um, and he's like, I don't know how that's going to work. And I'm like, you brought me in for a reason. Yeah. Like, trust the process. Like, it'll work. It's going to work. I bring it to the team. They're like, I don't know how that's going to work. I'm like, it's going to work. Trust the process. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult, right? It's, I, I'm coming in to an org in this instance, right? I, I quote, it was easier because it was kind of like, just take the reins and just do whatever you have to do. Here's some money, go make it happen, right? Because the team didn't exist. So you're building from scratch. Other teams that I've joined as the leader, it was it was difficult in the sense it's like I was either replacing somebody who was there and they were getting moved into a different role and they weren't ready to let go of that baby or somebody had left or been removed and I've joined and it's like, okay, so you're building a team that has like an existing idea of what's going on. This team was like a really small core group that had grown really close over the few years that they had been together. Um, uh, Kobe's a really phenomenal leader. I mean, he has a really servant style, humble leadership mentality. Um, and because of that, he's had very, very strong retention in the employees that he's had. So a lot of these guys are like legacy employees who have been here since employee number four or something like that. You know, employee number three is over there. Employee number two is in the other room. Right. And now it's, so you come into really what is like a brotherhood. And then I walk in and go, you guys are doing this all wrong. And they're like, who is this guy? Yeah. What are you talking about? But the the really great thing was that like I immediately had the buy in of like Logan, who's a leader in the org, and the buy in from Kobe, who's a leader in the org, and the buy in of our chief of staff, who's a leader in the org, and it really took the buy in of the team to kind of make the dramatic shifts that that we've implemented, um, making sure that where we want to be in a year is starting now. So that we're not kind of figuring it out six months from now and just doing the hard work now and making that really difficult change now so that when we start hitting our stride in six months, we're not like, oh, gosh, I really wish that we had just done that now. It's You got to kind of put your foot down and be the bad guy sometimes. Yeah. And I think uh, to give my perspective on all this, which is it's an interesting podcast because I, you know, I'm part of Middle Tech, but I also have been working here and getting a front row seat. So it's fun to share some mm -hmm. of like my perspective, what I've learned on this. And it was tough. It was really tough. And I knew it was going to be tough coming into it. Uh, you know, we we had a great time building Lead Rilla in the early days. We we got to, we invented a new game that's kind of like pickleball now. We probably should have commercialized that in and of itself. <laughs> but I say this to say, like, you know, it, there wasn't as much intensity as there needed to be for us to become like a $100 million company or, or higher. And so when the decision to bring Chris on came about, that's when I knew, like, yes, this needs to happen. Yes, this is going to be really hard. This is going to bring a lot of change into the organization. And even for me personally, you know, my role changed from like more kind of business development, supporting our larger accounts to, okay, you're going to be doing outreach now. You're going to be trying to generate some of your own revenue, which is, was really tough for me, still is tough for me. I'm still learning a lot. 
but I knew I needed to learn that. Well, funny story there is from my perspective, I saw this happen too. And I'm sitting there making, <laughs> I'm sitting there making lunch one day and Logan walks in to our apartment and he's got his tail between his legs. I mean, he looks like he just got beat up. And I'm like, what's Chris going on? He's like, this. dude, we're... Must I'm be Chris's first week. Yeah. I don't know what it was. I mean, oh, but I'm like, what's going on? He's like, dude, I just start cold calling, man. I'm just like, this is hard. I'm like, yeah, it's how it goes, hard, man. man. Good thing you're learning that. Yeah. Um, but no, it was... That's we, hysterical. We knew it was going to be challenging. It's been challenging for everyone, but in the yeah. best way. And I think one of the major things that we needed that we didn't have that you've helped establish is the systems to do an outbound repeatable, predictable sales process. And we're experimenting a ton right now. And that has been such a huge learning experience and figuring out my role in that and how I can support and lead in that as well has been really important to me. Um, so good to see you for coming in and sticking with us through that because, God, you came into not much uh, in the terms of give, that realm. Give a lot of credit to yourself, though, yeah. like and to the rest of the team here, too. There's a, there's a, a great um, like synopsis of mentality and it revolves around like you can either be like cattle or you could be like a bison. When you're look at the great plains of our country, right? Let me explain. And a crazy storm comes in. The cattle will run away from the storm. And as you run away from the storm and you move with it, that storm stays over you for a long time because you're running with it. The bison look at that storm and say, oh, we're going to run right through it. And they get it over with quickly. The team here could have taken the cattle approach where it's like, uh, I don't really want to do this. I don't, uh, and you just dredge through the nuance for a much longer period of time and much less gets done. This entire team looked at this, you know, hurricane the storm that is Chris, hur hurricane, <laughs> hurricane Chris coming in and just said, you know what, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to just attack this thing. And, and, you know, uh, really no one had great joy in all these changes. I would be <laughs> lying if I said that everybody came in, everybody was like, yay, we're going to do everything he's saying. It was, you know, it was a little bit of tooth and nail, but for the most part, and as you see now, right, that we're, what, 90 days into this, into this experiment, um, I don't think that anybody on the team would say that this has been a change for the worst. Well, and one question I've got is oftentimes when you raise that seed or that Series A, you get a bunch of funding in, how have both of you managed to grow the business intelligently and allocate resources and not go over your rails and, and overspend, which something is that I've experienced in an org when we're scaling up our sales organization and trying to scale the business after a fundraise, you know, sometimes you get that money in the bank and you're like, okay, let's, let's deploy this. Right. Sometimes you overdo it. How have you guys taken an approach to growing the business intelligently and making sure that you're not, you know, overextending yeah. the team and, and your resources? Yeah, it's tough because after a raise, you're, you're very excited. You have a bunch of money. You, In our case, we had a product that people were using, and we just wanted to get it into the hands of people. So we could have went and hired 20 salespeople. But for us, like we take a step back, and a lot of this is because of uh, our our investor, Mucker Capital, and Omar Hamoui, who is on our board. Um, who I'm, I can talk about his story in a bit. Um, you know, he, he has this, this analogy that he says is we can forecast – that it's going to rain next week, but we need to plan to bring an umbrella for that rain. And so when we look at our business, we're always planning two years ahead. So our hires that we're making, we're planning for the revenue that that's going to bring in. And we're very strategic about that. It's mostly what my role is now. Uh, I don't get to write code anymore. Chris doesn't let me sell anything anymore. So I just get to look at numbers. So that's fun. Uh, but it's just being very strategic and just data like data-driven, de data deploying our capital just efficiently, um, and monitoring that on a on a daily basis. So, and what what piece of data might you look at and say, okay, we need something here? What's an example of a leading indicator where I need to deploy more resources? I think there's a lot of them. Um, I mean, one thing is just input from your team. I mean, you can see pain points when they happen. Um, an advisor of of mine told me probably a couple of years ago that. You know, a, a company is a living, breathing thing, right? It's like this this being. And at any point in time throughout your journey, your company will tell you what it needs. The question is, is the founder going to listen and execute on it, whether it's an easy decision or a hard decision? So for us, like, we just look at the business. Like, it tells us what it needs. If engineering is way behind and sales is saying we need these, these features built, but engineers are, the backlog is insane, they're not going to get to it. 
our business is telling us something there. We probably need to need to invest in engineers. And there's a ton of like rabbit holes that can go down. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk uh, about that a little bit more in depth when we talk about the fundraising part of, of, of this interview. Um, but before we get there, I want to talk about this transition from Lead Rilla to Sales River. And, you know, let's start with how that happened and why that happened, the, the story behind it. Because there is some, you know, some ups and downs that we kind of went through on the way to getting there. And then all of a sudden this customer came to us with kind of a new way to use our product. And yep. I'll let you take it from there. What's, what's the story that got us to Sales River? Yeah, for sure. So I'll do a very quick uh, overview of like how Lead Rilla started. So it started in 2019. Uh, my oldest brother has an insurance agency. He was having challenges with finding consumers that were shopping for his product. At this time, we didn't know what a lead was. Uh, we didn't know what the legion industry was, but I told my brother, you know, we had four engineers in the office and said, let us try to help. So we started running ads, uh, generated leads for him. And the next thing you know, we had 200 agents knocking on our door asking for the same stuff. And so at that point, we're like, we may have something here. Uh, so that's when we pivoted from our previous business, which was software consulting, uh, and went all in on Leadrilla. That's when Leadrilla was born. Uh, so we launched that platform. It grew very quickly because everything was self-serve. We had thousands of agents buying leads and calls from us. Um, and over the course of four years, the Leadrilla platform kind of morphed, kind of morphed, and like all these new features got built in because we had to serve these thousands of agents. We had to manage it. We had to make it easy for us from a uh, OPEX perspective just to be able to support all these agents in an automated way. And so in 20, 2021, we started getting a, a lot of interest from national carriers, large FMOs, uh, agencies. They wanted to use our software, uh, but we just weren't set up in a way to license the platform and the code we had built. Um, so for about a year, we said no to that until 2022, um, one of our customers who is Amerilife, um, one of the largest national brokerages for life and, and health products, came to us with that same idea. They wanted to use the, the actual software, brand it to them, have all their agents on it, track everything, route leads and calls, track performance, um, make strategic decisions on marketing budgets and tracking their ROI. So that was the first one we said yes to. Uh, we spent about three months basically extracting the code base that powers Lead Rilla and creating this enterprise SaaS platform, which today is called is Sales River. Uh, so we launched their white labeled version of Lead Rilla uh, in August of 2022. Um, we're, they've been a customer for just over a year now. Uh, they're awesome. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was the transition. So that kind of carried into the Series A raise in December of last year. And then on February 2nd, I believe, we launched the Sales River brand. Uh, and now today we have two brands. Sales River is our enterprise SaaS platform, which is our main focus. And then we have LeadRilla.com, which still runs as the LeadRilla brand, still has thousands of agents going on there. Um, so, Yeah, and I want to pull out a point about that story in Amerilife specifically. Amerilife was like the ideal customer for what Sales River became. And to be able to have a new client like that come to us and see the vision for what lead Rilla could be. And then for us to be able to sit in meetings with them and say, what exactly do you need? And how can our platform support what you're looking for and have them tell us what they needed? Invaluable. I don't know if we would have gotten to where we are today without that input from, from how they kind of informed us. And now we have all of these incredible features that we're working on with the devs that we've kind of hired from the fundraise. And I'm just so incredibly excited about where this is going to lead us. Um, so I just wanted to kind of pull that out, like having that, that Amerilife come to us and do that was, was a big pivotal moment in the business, yeah. like landing that and then getting it launched and having it be successful is just, I mean, pat yeah. everyone on the back for that. That was, yeah. that was a big deal. Somewhat, somewhat luck. I mean, yeah. you know, we're building this platform where yeah. we've spent three, four years, a lot of money, a lot of time. Um, so many ups and downs throughout that process. Like it's a roller coaster. And then we meet that client like you said, the, the perfect use case and things we had spent time building for three or four years. We never knew that was a perfect fit for Amerilife. Right. Four years prior, we didn't even know who Amerilife was. <laughs> but then we get in meetings and we're like telling them this is what's, I, I remember one meeting when we, I think it was our first demo. Um, it was their SVP of growth marketing. They'd, after the demo, he said, this is what I've been thinking about 
like putting together for years. I just didn't know it existed. And so when that relationship started to form features like from their input, like it was, we, we kind of have the same vision. And when you have like us as a company and then our customer and we have a shared vision, it's, it was pretty cool. Why don't you all speak on, there's a concept of, you know, innovation often comes from the outside, from people that don't understand an industry. And then there's a reason for that because people in the industry, they're so in the weeds of what they're doing that they just can't see beyond that. And oftentimes it takes, you know, a stroke of, you know, call it luck or just vision or something where somebody builds something that ha happens to apply really well to a, a, an industry. Can you all speak to kind of why this is the unique opportunity and kind of what insight you maybe brought to the industry that other people within it just didn't see in order to build, you know, the value you guys have? And you might be able to answer that best because you're you've yeah. been in it for a while. Before you, so I remember our first conference that we ever went to. It was in Denver. Um, it was I think it was Lead Generation World or Contact. It was one of them. Um, Michael Furry runs those. Shout out to Michael. Uh, so that was our first conference we ever went to. We I think we had just launched like the first version of our platform. Um, I mean, barely any revenue. It's four guys from Kentucky go walking into this conference and who doesn't are, know you guys didn't know who AmeriLife was. I thought that was pretty funny. You just said, Oh yeah, yeah. We didn't know yeah. who AmeriLife was. We didn't know who anybody was. Yeah. We, I mean, three months prior to this, we, I don't even think we knew what a lead was. Yeah. And so we, we have this whole idea. We're going to take over the, the lead gen industry. We're going to build this whole platform. So we go to the conference and we're talking, walking around talking to people and, you know, people ask us what we do. We're like, Oh, we're building a, a lead, lead gen platform for independent agents. And every single one of them, like, you are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with agents is a nightmare. Like each individual agents and doing that at scale with like tens of thousands of agents, it's impossible. And for us, we were like, like kind of taken back by that. We're like, wait, no one's done this yet. Like, it seems pretty simple. Like my brother has an agency. He has, he just told me all these pain points he has six months ago. Why is nobody solving that? And so I saw that as a huge opportunity. We have no competitors. And so if we pull it off and it works, and they have a pretty good business here. So that's my perspective as like the newcomer into the industry. I don't know if you have any. No, I mean, it's, a, it's, I think it's more about like, do you want to listen to the people who are like in the, in the industry? And like you said, are, are too close to it. And it's like, can you see the forest through the trees? Right. The forest is the hundreds of thousands of independent agents that exist. It's much easier to build a business that services the thousand or so call centers that exist. Why? Because it's one entry point. You get a yes, and you can now route calls to that call center. Keep it simple. This model of each independent agent is essentially like their own business, right? So it's, just, it's much more difficult to track, manage, and do. So I think that, it, in generally speaking, the reason why nobody went down that road is because it was, in theory, like a huge undertaking. But again, as I said at the beginning of this, right, when I saw what you build, I was like, damn, this makes perfect sense, right? And I think that he and I kind of bonded on that, right? As I'm hearing that story, we probably bonded because everybody else was telling you you're nuts. And I'm sitting here saying, that's genius, yeah. right? Because why do you want to be like everyone else, right? Like why, in, in, in a world of people building the matchstick, like build a light bulb, Right? What's the point of doing the same thing everyone else is doing? How do you ever differentiate yourself, right? Like, what is, what's your business's brand? What's your personal brand? Like, have your own personal brand, right? And his personal brand is kind of like, all right, I see what you're doing. I'm going to probably build something a little bit better. And now what happens? We service all these independent field agents. Guess what? We can still service those other clients too, right? Like, exactly. <laughs> so you're not like, you're not like pigeonholing yourself to just the independent field agents, right? And a lot of people can't see that picture, a lot of people will hear that story of, oh, you're just building for field agents. You're crazy. Blah, blah. It's like, no, I'm building for field agents now. And then I'm going to get everybody else as well. And by doing that, we've kind of found a better way yeah. to serve all of them, which we'll get into here in just a second. Um, I want to ask another question, and I want you to lead this into the vision of what, of what we're building at Sales River. But I, wanna, I want you to tell the story of the relevance of the Sales River name, because one, I just think it's such an awesome name for a company. Um, and you know, the fact that we had a domain that was open for that is crazy too. Um, but yeah, tell, tell the relevance of the sales river name, where it came from, why, what it means to you personally. Um, and then talk about the vision for this product. Okay. 
Yeah. So for sales river, um, I mean, you mentioned domain. That's typically where you kind of have to start these days when you want to domain, when you start a company salesriver.com. Wow. <laughs> so finding that kind of, we thought of the name prior to this, but then the domain was available. It was like, okay, this is perfect. Um, so we wanted the name to represent the sales process. Um, you know, a sales process is constantly moving. It's never static. Um, and we thought through all these different names, there were some crazy ones. I remember like eight of us sitting out in like the cafe area of our office, like trying to use AI systems to like come up with random names. <laughs> They're all terrible. Um, but we came across, uh, the name sales river it was actually recommended by, uh, the partner at Mucker Capital, who's on our board. He recommended it. Um, and you know, if you think of a river, the first ever form of one of the first ever forms of automation was the water wheel. Um, that's a little history lesson. If you want to go search that and, and read up on it, it's pretty cool. Um, but a river is kind of a perfect representation of not only a, a general sales process in, in for any organization, but also how our platform helps push the sales process along. Um, a river has multiple channels flowing in and out to smaller and larger bodies of water. There's a ton of analogies that go into like our product and actually how it works, which is really cool. Um, so we kind of fell in love with that name. Another thing that made me fall in love with it uh, is I have two daughters. My oldest daughter's name is River. Uh, and so... When Omar recommended the he he thought of the name and sent it to me via email, he didn't know my daughter's names when he said that. So my response to him, I didn't say anything about the name. I just said, "Do you know what my oldest daughter's name is?" Uh, and so, anyways, that's that's how we came up with the name Sales River. It's a perfect fit. There's even product features in our platform. Uh, one is for like hierarchy management. Every any sales org has some type of hierarchy, and marketing budget can get funneled throughout that. Performance visibility needs to be viewed throughout. Um, and so that, that feature is called Teams. And one of the marketing uh, terminologies we use is upstream and downstream. It's a, a play on the sales of her name. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the story. We fell in love with it and went with it. So Yeah, and I want to talk about the vision and, like, the why this product is so important. And it's been really cool to see because it's kind of – we've discovered it because our, our customers kind of discovered it first in the way that they were using our product. And it started with one of the national carriers allocating a lot of their funds on our platform. We in turn gave them all the data from how those agents were performing with the leads and calls they got from our platform. And they used that data to reallocate the funds that they were distributing uh, more effectively, thus decreasing their cost per sale, how much they spent to, to get a new beneficiary on. That was really powerful because we helped them year over year reduce that cost per sale significantly. And that was kind of the first, okay, this this data play is a big part of it. And then, you know, Marilife comes along, and that's when we really understand all of the data that our platform can generate. And that's where we really hit on in the sales process. Like, our platform can help you materially reduce your cost per sale because we're giving so much transparency into how your agents are working the leads and calls, into where the leads and calls are coming from, the performance of the different lead sources, the performance of the different agent groups. And so now we've come across this product and Chris, I'd like you to kind of hit on this just from your perspective in the industry that is a radical transformation of how much transparency we can give to an organization. And I think that as a young guy who wants to make a difference in an industry and like build something cool is really what matters a lot to me is like, we've come in and improved something that needed badly to be oh, yeah. improved. So speak on that part of it. So, I mean, let's call it what it is, right? A lot of what sales river is and does exists kind of right like i call it frankenstein they've got a platform that feeds into another 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 one and another one and another one and above all those platforms lives the head of some engineering team that has to pull the data from each one of these five platforms in order for an executive team to make any kind of educated choice decision or movement right and what they're going to do with their organizational structure I just, I'm working on marketing to call that Frankenstein. Like, let's just kill Frankenstein, right? <laughs> it's ridiculous that as much money as, as, particularly in like the insurance industry, like some pretty big businesses in that space. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or not, right? There's a lot of money exchanging hands. And the fact that like, there's so many of these homegrown platforms that I've seen used and experienced that are so clunky 
and so slow moving and so difficult to manipulate. And then you have to wait for a data team to give you the feedback or you have to plug in to yet another software to like give you the data out on a regular consistent basis. And it always breaks and it always needs fixing. And you know, you're constantly like, oh, these numbers aren't reporting right. Why is this happening? And it's ridiculous. So much so that we show the platform to people who are using, and some of these teams have spent, in some cases, millions of dollars on their own Frankenstein. And they're like, yeah, we're good. We're going to go ahead and just go with this because it works better, it's cleaner, it's easier, and it just makes sense, right? Um, and when something's cleaner, easier, and simpler, it means you're going to be able to do more with it, which means that, like, the not the C senior executive, but, like, the actual floor manager sitting there working with a group of agents can immediately see the successes or fails of net new agents live in platform and immediately give them responsive training based on marketing pieces because he can get in and through his own little platform within our platform can see, okay, the call that they're struggling with is a warm transfer, right? Or, but they're doing really good with like cold inbounds. Explain to them the nuances of the difference between somebody who's been outbound dialed and then transferred in versus a consumer who's shopped online and sees it. And it's just a different approach of how to sell the product that they're trying to sell. That immediate, I mean, it pays for itself after a while, right? Doesn't it? If your tool enables your team to sell better and make more money, doesn't that tool then inherently pay for itself over a period of time? Yeah. And I mean, we could, we could sit and talk a lot about the nuances of how we built the product in terms of we're, we were one of the first companies in the industry in the lead Rilla days of building a user experience that was so intuitive and so simple that like any agent could figure it out. And so rolling that into the sales river product and being like, you know, you might have thousands of agents that struggle to pick up new technology and adopt new technology. We built a platform that is like easier than them using Facebook that they use every day. Like it was so intuitive to use. It's really, it's a fun product for me to go on and demo to these clients because it's so impressively simple yet complex on the back end. And I think that's a beautiful way to build a product. Um, let's move into talking about fundraising. I know we're, we're coming up on time. Maybe we run long on this interview, but I want to dig into the fundraising experience because we fundraised at an interesting time in the market. It basically got in like right before the market just cooled completely at the last second. Um, so talk about one, the decision to raise capital and what your fundraising experience was like and what yeah. you learned from it. Yeah. So we were so funded for the first three and a half, four years, somewhere around there. Um, I was never really like all in on raising. Like we, we built the, we started the company, we funded it. A year in, we you know didn't have many employees. We were cash flow positive. We started reinvesting, and you know the next thing we knew, we, we got three years in, and you know started having a lot of interest from these big companies. And as we started to realize what we had, and realizing that we're ahead of the market in terms of the platform that we have, there's there's not really do any direct competitors. There's definitely companies out there that could, you know, cut, try to rebuild what we have and try to catch. But we just didn't want to let that happen. And so we reached a point where we knew we had something that, that no one else had. We knew we had something that people wanted and needed. And we knew there was a huge market for it. And so for us, the decision was pretty easy. It was like, let's raise money. Let's invest into this company. And let's grow as quick as we, quickly as we can. Um, so that was the decision part of it. Uh, the actual raising wasn't as easy as the decision. <laughs> Uh, we raised for about nine months. Um, I, I had a tally of how many pitches I did. It was at 143. One of them to, to my former company. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, throughout that process had a, a wide variety of conversations with VCs all throughout the country. Many, you know, a lot of them in the Midwest in the Kentucky area and surrounding states um, out on the West coast. Um, and so, you know, going through that, I learned a lot just in terms of like how to position our company and how to talk about it to investors. Um, it made me think about my business a little differently, like how we think about our numbers and like projections and market. Um, and so anyways, nine months of, of pitching and month eight, we got an in, intro to Mucker Capital who's based in LA. I knew within the first five minutes of the call uh, with Omar um, that it was a perfect fit. I mean, the, the questions he was asking, um, his background, uh, Omar started AdMob and sold that to Google in 2010. 
uh, for $750 million. Um, and then after that, he was a partner at Sequoia Capital for six years. And so he's seen businesses at our stage that have succeeded and failed. He's probably seen more fail than succeed. And so with Omar being an operator, um, having that experience and background, um, I just knew it was a good fit. And so a few more conversations later, uh, talking to their other partners, uh, we had a term sheet and December 2022, we closed the round. Um, so it was history from there. The rest is history. And man, yep. it's been it's been awesome giving you somebody else in addition to Chris as well, but having somebody come on the board that has that experience and kind of feeling, cause you know, you're a solo founder. Yeah. So having somebody that can come in and has seen that, that before has probably been hugely beneficial to you. Um, and something that that fundraising led to that we were alluding to earlier was growing the team and making those key hires. And one of the questions I want to talk about is, you know, what it's been like growing the team from, you know, you know, there's four of us, five of us um, yeah. in 2020 to now there's 23 of us in, in 2023. Uh, so talk about what has been the hardest part of growing a company to 23 employees and what have you learned from it? Yeah. Well, what part of the hardness do you want me to talk about? I mean, <laughs> there's so many pieces of this that are just yeah. so challenging growing. Um, whenever what I've learned, like whenever a company adds a couple employees, like say you go from five to 10, you just double the size of your company. A lot of things change whether you want it to or not. Culture changes. Um, there's changes that have to happen by force, um, whether that's you know structure of who reports to who, whatnot, going from 10 to 15 to 20, and now we're at 23 now. Um, that's a lot of change. Going from 10, which we were at probably a year and a half ago, to more than double that. Um, I think one thing that I learned um, pretty quickly after we raised and started hiring a decent amount of, of, of new employees is that I can't wear every hat. And so by nature, I'm a builder. Like I like doing things. I want to be in control. Um, and that's something I had to learn pretty quickly. And, and a quick so, tangent, talk about all the things yeah. you're doing, like finance development, people, um, <laughs> like you're doing it all. Well, I'm a junior accountant by just by learning it and having to <laughs> do it for this business for four years. Uh, helping engineers with like product roadmap, specking new features, um, sales, like being in sales calls with, with you and, and, and some of the other guys, um, all the marketing, writing blog posts. Uh, it, it, it's just a lot. I mean, and even when I wasn't doing the daily work, it was having 15 people report to me. And that's a lot. Flat organization. Very flat. And so one of the first things um, Omar said we need to do is we need to identify leadership roles and we have to break our team out. And so, you know, Chris started pretty soon after that. We've made quite a bit of just like structure changes with our org chart. Um, one analogy I always talk about, and I've talked to Chris about this, is if you think about a basketball team, the coaches can't go in and score all the points. The players have to. It's the coach's job to put the right players on the court to go execute and win the game. And then you can even scale that to a football team. You have the head coach, you have the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, and then you have all these other quarterback coach, uh, defensive line coach. So you have all these middle managers, and if everybody's not doing their part with their piece of the team, ultimately the team's not going to win. And so that's just an analogy I like to use because I'm a sports guy. Um, that's a good one. Say keep it with basketball because I was employee number 23. So shout out to <laughs> Michael Jordan. I'm coming for you. I'm sure he's watching. Well, Chris, to, to pass it back over to you, you know, you're obviously, as we've spoken about, one of the key hires here. And your background is much more in the industry than it was in like software sales. Um, so talk a little bit about your transition to software sales, uh, how it's been different for you, how it's been the same, and maybe some of, some of your learnings from that. Yeah. I mean, look, I'd say that really the only challenge has been just starting to learn the nuances of like a new sales process, right? I mean, it's a very, very different product from what I've been working in historically. A lot of the day-to-day -day nuance is the same, right? It's coming in with, a, with a, an aggressive, positive attitude. It's coming in with the energy that you need to do to be successful. It's coming in with a leadership tangent to build your team and grow them together, rowing in the same direction, right? Um, but what has been uh, challenging is is probably the wrong word, but what has it's like reinvigorated me, right? 
You do the same thing every day for a long, long time. It just it's, it got easy, man. I was bored. You know, this is not harder or easier than what I did before. But what's cool is I'm learning like a whole new sales cycle. I'm learning like a whole new onboarding cycle. I'm learning how to organize a sales structure so that like it's endlessly repeatable as you you talked about before, right? Not just from like, how are we doing our outreach? What are we doing? What tools are we using? What AI are we onboarding, right? But like, how are we organizing our team to make sure that this is like rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat without like bogging down, overwhelming, overloading, or like slowing down in any way? You know, you know me, I, we're going 100 miles per hour, whether you want to or not, right? So, um, that's that's been the best part. Yeah, no, 100 miles an hour for sure. I think you said it multiple times. You're like, I don't think it'd be good for either of us to be in office together all the time. Like, it's good that I'm partly yeah, remote. 100%. Because we would all drive each other crazy, I think. Um, all right, well, as we wrap up this conversation and uh, talk more about the future of what this business looks like, um, let's talk about what the next few years specifically look like. Not way out in the future, but, you know, one to three years from now. Next time we have you on the Spotlight Series to talk about Sales River, what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, I mean, our roadmap is jam-packed. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we're building. Just to get deeper into the sales process and like have features that automate various aspects of that and honestly just work towards our mission of providing visibility to our customers that allow them to make data-driven strategic growth decisions. Um, and so there will probably be some AI features that we may or may not have engineers working on right now. Um, that's going to be pretty exciting. <laughs> we will eventually expand. You know, right now we're focused on insurance, uh, mostly life insurance and health insurance, uh, but expanding our business horizontally, uh, going into other verticals. Um, there's, you know, auto insurance, home services. There's a ton of subcategories. Um, I, there's probably... 10 to 15 very, very large markets we could go after outside of insurance. Uh, so eventually we'll we'll expand um, horizontally. And yeah, you got anything to add to that? What, what, what are some of your goals from a sales perspective? Like where do you want to see us get to either from a, a revenue perspective or whatever metric you're judging your performance on over the next one to three years? Look, I, it's pretty easy, right? I joined this company because... Uh, really the only thing that I feel like I haven't directly achieved in my career is building a unicorn, right? Getting that B behind your valuation. Uh, that is my only goal. And when we get to one, it's going to get to five. When we get to five, it's to get to 20. You just keep going from there. Like there's no end, right? I'm not a spring chicken, but I'm not so old that it's like, oh, well, once we get to a number, I'm done, right? I can't be home all day. I've got four kids. They drive me crazy. Um, we want to we want to aggressively scale. I want to get I want to get insurance to the point where there's you know a, a large number of like really key players in there. And I don't think I've clearly defined necessarily what that is. But once we get super stable there, maybe it's maybe it's getting to the point where just the valuation on our business is half a billion with the insurance groups that we have on. Maybe at that point we start really building into some of these other verticals. You have your team there. Right. And I feel like even with the existing team that we have, I feel like we've got enough people who really get it to where that team could start to really run itself, you know, and then Kobe and I can pivot into like, okay, now we're going to go take down legal, take down travel, take down home services, take down whatever vertical it is, build a team of superstars there, let that start to run itself. And then at that point, we have this model of not just replicating for one vertical, but replicating into multiple verticals. And the third time we do it, it's gonna be easier than that. And the fourth time, it'll be easier than that because you'll have this rinse and repeat success model. I'd love nothing more than to see everyone in our org that exists today, that like comes in every day, ready, hungry, and wants to do it, continue to ascend in their career. You know, Me joining drastically raised the median age of this group, right? Uh, it's a lot of young, hungry people here. And it's just, it's, it's cool to be around. No doubt about that. Well, you know, from my perspective, I just have a lot of gratitude to both of you. You know, Kobe, we've worked together now for three and a half years and it's been incredible to learn from you and be able to play an active role in shaping the direction that this company is going. I mean, uh, it's just been quite a ride and Chris to have you come in and bring the experience and bring the intensity that, that was needed and is needed. Um, 
has just been an incredible career experience for me. So thank you from me to both of you for pouring into me uh, as a as a young man. And I can't tell you how excited I am to see where it goes from here. We've got we got a lot of runway ahead of us. So before we uh, let you go completely, anybody that's listening to this podcast that wants to learn more about Sales River or each of you individually. Um, drop where they can learn more and maybe uh, how to find you on LinkedIn or social media or something like that. Yeah, salesriver.com. Uh, you can check me out on LinkedIn, Kobe Hastings. Kobe, like Kobe Bryant, but with a Y at the end, K-O-B-Y, Hastings. Uh, probably the same website, I would assume. And then uh, <laughs> uh, my last name is uh, Michelson, but there's no A. So it's Chris Michelson, M-I-C-H-E-L-S-O-N. Love it. Thank you guys for the time. And uh, I guess let's go back to work for the rest of the day now. Let's do it. Go get some lunch, right? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys.